this. Uh, I don't have anyone's uh, faces up, so uh, it would just be uh, names that might appear on the uh, side if somebody talks. So uh, today's the uh, second half of uh, chapter one, which is the uh, evolution of the Intel x86 architecture. And you can see I put a cool cat and a baseball cap to uh, jazz up my uh, presentation. We're also going to talk about the ARM architecture, uh, the Internet of Things, and uh, embedded systems. So uh, the Intel architecture has been around uh, for quite a while. And uh, it actually started in the uh, 1970s. I was born in 1970, so I came a little bit before the 4004. Uh, but that was the uh, first Intel chip. And in terms of market share, they've ranked as the number one maker of microprocessors for non-embedded systems. That's general purpose computing for uh, decades. And uh, it seems that they're uh, unlikely to yield that uh, position uh, anytime soon. Um, this one shows a bit of the evolution uh, in the 1970s. I have Disco Stu so that you know it's the uh, 1970s. Um, and interestingly, as they've grown more complex and uh, uh, detailed, Intel's actually picked up the uh, pace of the uh, development of those processors. Um, and they used to develop uh, them about every four years, but they hope to keep uh, rivals at bay by trimming a year or two off the development time. And they've done that with the most uh, recent generations in this uh, x86 uh, processor line. So the 4004 is the first one, 1971. It was the first single chip CPU and it had a four uh, width uh, bus. In one year, it doubled to eight bits for the uh, bus. That was the uh, 8008. And um, if you're curious, I started out with the uh, 8086, I think was uh, the first uh, Intel chip uh, computer that I used. Uh, 1980s brought uh, increased uh, change, um, and the uh, 286 uh, had 16 megabytes of uh, memory instead of just uh, one megabyte of memory. The 386 was the uh, first 32-bit machine, and the 486 had the uh, built-in math coprocessor, an on-chip cache, and uh, it also had instruction pipeline. Uh, the 90s got even better, and that was when the uh, Pentium came in, and uh, when I got my Pendium, it seemed like the most awesome thing in the world at the time. Uh, it had the uh, superscalar technology, and it just went so much faster than the uh, 486 I was uh, programming on at the time. Um, Pendium Pro had branch prediction, data flow analysis, and also did a speculative execution that we're going to learn about a little bit uh, later on in terms of the instruction set architecture. Uh, the Pentium 2 had MMX technology, which focused on processing video, audio, and graphics, uh, as well as uh, data more efficiently. And that's kind of when we came into the uh, programming of the multimedia. And I remember uh, programming multimedia toolbook on the uh, Pentium 2. And uh, it was uh, really neat to see those multimedia and hypermedia applications uh, come together as a result of that processor. But you know, you can see that we went from, you know, at the beginning in the 1990s, about 16 megahertz, um, all the way up to uh, 300 megahertz by uh, 1997. 2000s uh, got even better. Um, the uh, Pentium 3 uh, had additional floating point instructions, uh, uh, streaming SIMD extensions, um, and 70 new uh, instructions uh, designed to increase performance when you were doing exactly the same uh, instructions on multiple data objects. Uh, Pentium 4 included additional floating point and other enhancements. Uh, the core uh, that you see there was the first Intel x86 uh, microprocessor with a dual core. And if you remember back to the um, discussion we had on the dual core, it uh, referred to the implementation of two cores on a single chip. Uh, core 2 extended that to 64 bits uh, in terms of the architecture. And the Core 2 Quad provided four cores on a single chip. More recent core offerings have up to 10 cores per chip at the uh, time that I uh, wrote this, which was 2020. Um, and an uh, important uh, addition to that architecture was the advanced vector extensions instruction set that provided a set of 256, then 512-bit uh, instructions for efficient processing of vector data. So. Uh, Intel has uh, made uh, rapid gains uh, over the years. I don't uh, yeah, a little chat here.
Uh, the processing cost has gone down significantly. I, gosh, I remember paying, um, it would have to be um, early 2000s. I think I had a Pentium 4 and I remember paying like uh, $700 uh, Canadian for that uh, uh, machine. Uh, I would imagine you could get uh, something that's uh, much faster now for a uh, similar price. And gosh, I can't remember what we paid for the uh, 8086 or the um, Pentiums. The Pentium was probably around a thousand bucks at the time. And my uh, boss said, hey, that's a major investment we're making in you to get you this uh, computer. Uh, Nowadays, I think it'd be hard to find a Pentium, um, but certainly the uh, processing power of the uh, machine I have uh, uh, now uh, is uh, definitely better than that Pentium. So the uh, next topic in the uh, chapter is embedded systems. And anybody know what this little guy is? Isn't that a Furby? Yeah, that's a Furby, and um, Furbies came up about a couple of years ago because they were considered a risk to national security if they were to be put in government offices because they had the ability to uh, record uh, conversations on their chips, apparently. Uh, and if you've checked uh, the module uh, one, there is a little link to the Furby organ that uses the embedded aspects of these uh, Furbies to make a... Uh, hideous uh, sounding organ. But they're an example of an embedded system, which basically refers to the use of electronics and software within a product as opposed to a general purpose computer. So, you know, the Furbies have um, chips embedded in them, uh, but they're not a general purpose uh, computer. You know, likewise, the greeting card that we talked about on uh, Tuesday has a chip embedded in it, but again, not a general purpose computer. And, you know, a lot of devices sold today have embedded systems. Uh, you know, certainly things like our cell phones, uh, printers have um, intelligent aspects to them. Uh, you know, even toothbrushes, uh, you know, electronic toothbrushes will time exactly how long you've uh, brushed your teeth and, um, you know, um, grade you on the motion of how well you've uh, brushed them. Uh, so, you know, those are examples of embedded systems. And, you know, a lot of times they have real-time constraints and interact with their external environments. I'm thinking of the uh, embedded systems for the anti-lock brakes on my uh, automobile, you know, in terms of that. And in most cases, they have simple or no human computer interface. Again, you know, the thing about the toothbrush or the anti-lock brakes, uh, there's, you know, very simple interface, uh, you know, either turning on that toothbrush or depressing the uh, brake pedal. So, you know, it's not like I'm programming the anti-lock brakes. Um, they are field programmable, so you can change them uh, once they're out in the field, um, but the software generally has a fixed function. So there's a strong need for efficiency with these, which is why we often do a lot of assembly when we're um, doing uh, embedded systems. Uh, some areas are more similar to general computing, uh, such as your smartphone or, um, you know, things like uh, smart TVs or um, yeah, trying to think of other ones. Anybody think of another one that's more general? Uh, tablet, I guess. <clears throat> so there are two approaches to uh, making operating systems for embedded systems. One is to take something you already have, like Windows or Linux, and deploy it on that embedded system, or design and implement an OS for embedded systems, such as Tiny OS. And there are two approaches to uh, processors. Uh, one is uh, application processors, uh, and those are uh, processors that can uh, execute complex operating systems general purpose in nature that are kind of like the Intel line and then dedicated processors that are dedicated to uh, one or a small number of tasks required by the embedded system. And the dedicated processor is really good because it has reduced size and cost. Uh, the Another topic that's uh, covered in chapter one, he does have a wide variety of topics is the uh, internet of things. Uh, the first time I heard this uh, term, I kind of did a double take. It's like, oh, what is Internet of Things? 
well, you know, obviously the internet has things, but it refers to the interconnection of smart devices. Um, you know, and those can range from, uh, you know, things such as your computer, your television set. Um, you know, anybody have a smart refrigerator? Anybody have a uh, appliance that they feel shouldn't be connected to the internet that is? Is it toothbrush, Kim? Yeah, you know, toothbrush, uh, sometimes they're connected up to the internet. Uh, I'm trying to think of other ones. Uh, that, that... I'm pretty sure my mom's like rice cooker is Wi-Fi. <laughs> it's like, do we need it to be Wi-Fi? I mean, I guess I'm getting old, um, you know. Somebody has one in the uh, chat. Um, vacuum cleaner, yeah. Uh, uh, dishwasher, there's another one. That, you know, I, All I, you I, suckers with Wi-Fi connected appliances are going to be screwed when the um, AI apocalypse comes. Uh, it'll kill me first. You know, I'm, I mean, that's why I relocated to Hawaii is, uh, you know, if it's Cthulhu, then, you know, it's going to get me real quick. And if it's, um, you know, Skynet, uh, well, I work in computer science. So I'm not going to stick around long enough to be the uh, John Connor and teach you how to fight back against the machines. But yeah, uh, once, uh, once it comes for me, that'll be the end of it. Uh, so uh, it's gone through a number of generations. Uh, the first was, you know, putting uh, things like our uh, personal computers, servers, routers, firewalls uh, online, uh, you know, and then moving up to uh, things, you know, such as smart kiosks, uh, medical machinery. If you've uh, been to the hospital, a lot of the uh, equipment is uh, networked uh, so that uh, the nurses station can keep track of what's going on uh, centrally uh, rather than having to visit each room uh, all the time. Uh, then we move to uh, putting personal technologies such as our smartphones, tablets, ebook readers online, and then sensor and actuator technology, which is the uh, you know, smaller components, even than those. Uh, another part of it was the ARM architecture, and there's really quite a bit of details in the uh, architecture diagram. I'll, I'll try to delve into uh, some of those, but uh, the ARM architecture refers to the ACORN risk machine uh, architecture, and it's a uh, reduced instruction set design uh, principle. So comparing that with the complex instruction set, I think at one point I said the Intel added 70 uh, separate instructions to more efficiently process data. RISC is a reduced instruction set where you have fewer number of uh, instructions, but uh, can you know, still use those in the uh, same way to uh, complete a task. Uh, the chips are high-speed processors known for their small die size and low power requirements. And again, you would expect this for uh, embedded systems. You don't want to uh, be uh, consuming a lot of power with uh, your cell phone or your uh, tooth smart toothbrush or your uh, dishwasher or uh, vacuum cleaner any more than necessary. Um, you know, as a result of being embedded in all these uh, small devices, it's uh, probably the most widely used uh, architecture in the world. So there are several uh, families. Um, there's Cortex-A, which is the application processors for the smartphones, ebook readers, digital TV, the more uh, general embedded systems. R is the real-time systems, such as the anti-lock brakes uh, that need rapid response. And the M is the microcontroller domain, and it's needed for fast, highly deterministic outputs, uh, such as factory uh, robotics. The, uh, Text itself focuses on the uh, Cortex M since that's the uh, most general purpose. And here is the detailed uh, detailed picture of the Cortex uh, M3 core, and uh, it has separate buses for instructions and data, uh, which is the Harvard architecture versus the von Neumann, which uh, doesn't have the separate buses for the instructions and data. They share you know, a single bus to uh, share the data between the uh, memory and the uh, different uh, parts of the uh, CPU, the control unit, and arithmetic logic unit. Uh, it includes uh, the uh, NVIC, uh, 
or sorry, it's uh, INVC, which uh, is a configurable interrupt uh, handler uh, for handling the abilities to processor. Um, the ETM, which is an operational debug component that uh, enables reconstruction of the program execution uh, so that you can debug it on the fly when you're programming down the field. Uh, there's a debug access port, uh, which is an interface for external debugging access to the processor. You can think of that debug port as uh, when you take your uh, vehicle into the uh, shop and they plug the uh, laptop into the um, automobile and uh, see what's wrong with it. Uh, there's also uh, possibilities of uh, doing uh, putting in uh, breakpoints uh, for uh, debugging. Um, other things you can see in there, memory protection unit. Uh, there's the uh, core and the uh, memory itself. Uh, parallel I.O. ports uh, for different I.O. schemes, as well as even a serial port. And I think the last time I took my vehicle in uh, and they plugged it in, they actually had a serial uh, port for that. Um, timers and triggers keep track of timing and uh, events and generate output waveforms and trigger uh, timed action and other peripherals that may be attached. Uh, clock management, energy management, uh, security, and um, there is also a uh, peripheral bus uh, associated with it. So uh, this is figure 1.16 in the uh, text, and there's a lot of detail um, in these uh, various components that you can uh, read about in the uh, chapter. I won't read you the chapter here. And last but not least is uh, cloud computing. and. Uh, should be familiar with that if you're using things uh, such as uh, Google Docs or you're using virtual machines. Uh, how many have one of Ted's classes? Uh, Ted's a big fan of uh, virtual machines. And if you're gonna take part in the uh, ACM ICPC, they'll also have uh, virtual machines. And these are great for uh, providing on-demand network access uh, to uh, a large pool of configurable computing resources, and you can scale them as to how much you need. So, you know, if you don't need all of the um, resources, you can scale them. And basically, the idea is to move the IT operations to a uh, internet connected infrastructure uh, known as cloud computing. If anybody's done any work with uh, Gil Vidal's, who's uh, one of our major uh, people that um, uh, hire our students, uh, he does a lot of cloud computing for uh, medical devices. And it's good because it gives you economies of scales, uh, professional network management. You can outsource uh, some of the IT uh, functions and also provide professional security management. Uh, different types of cloud services or software as a service. Uh, this provides service to customers in the form of software, um, you know, running on or accessible from the cloud, for example, Gmail or Salesforce. Um, yeah, I might even put uh, La Lima into that category. Uh, platform as a service, uh, provide services to customers in terms of a platform on which the customer applications can run. I would put Google App Engine and Amazon Web Services. And then infrastructure as a service, uh, the customer has access to the underlying cloud infrastructure and an example is Microsoft Azure, but I, I might also put uh, Amazon Web Services in there because they're pretty general in, what, in terms of what they offer. 